Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on healthy school buildings evidence based choices in school safe school openings. My name is Sasha Podolsky and I'm the advocacy director for AASA the school superintendents association and I am pleased to be your moderator for today's important webinar. AASA is thrilled to be partnering with our friends at the Basic Coalition, the National Association of Secondary School Principals, and the National Association of Elementary School Principals for this webinar, where we're going to discuss what it takes to make and keep physical school buildings safe and healthy for staff and students alike. Before we get started, let's take a minute to review some general housekeeping matters and logistics. The first is to make sure that everyone's connected to audio. The audio is available from your computer, and so just make sure the sound is on. The second housekeeping note is about muting. To ensure each person has a quality attendee, a quality experience rather, all attendees are going to be muted for the duration of the webinar. The third housekeeping item is about the Q&A segment, which will be a significant part of this webinar. So we have a lot of time for questions and all questions will be fielded using the chat feature. I know it's counterintuitive, you go to the questions part, but you use the chat feature to ask questions. Um, so please take a second now to look at the chat box on your screen. And if you don't see it, click on the chat tab and it should appear. And please send it to all panelists and attendees or just all panelists if you prefer in the pull down menu. Just type your message and press send and we will do our best to answer it. Uh, and we encourage you to post your questions as they arise because we'll all get to we'll get to them at the end. And the fourth and final housekeeping note is that we are recording today's session to share with all registrants and other uh, folks that you would like to share it to. So as soon as you'll get a recording of it and then you can share it with whomever. And we are also live streaming this on Facebook as well. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed presenter who will share his view on what school leaders need to understand as you try to maintain healthy buildings, healthy classrooms, healthy policies, healthy schedules, and healthy activities for students and school personnel during this pandemic. Dr. Joseph Allen is an assistant professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and co-author of Healthy Buildings, How Indoor Spaces Drive Performance and Productivity. He began his career conducting forensic health investigations of sick buildings. And at Harvard, Dr. Allen directs the Healthy Buildings program where he created the nine foundations of a healthy building. He works with Fortune 500 companies on implementing healthy building strategies in their global portfolios and presents internationally on this topic as well. And most importantly to us, he has written some recommendations and guidance for school openings and it's his expertise and insight into the education aspect of building safety that brings him to us today. And we're very fortunate, as he was telling me earlier, he is working seven days a week, 4 a.m. to midnight most of those days, getting inquiries from school districts around the country, and he's going to share a lot of great wisdom and knowledge with you. And unfortunately, um, our other presenter, Emily Oster, had planned to join us today, but she had to unexpectedly cancel about two hours ago due to a personal issue. And I know she really wishes she could be here with us today. So uh, sorry if you were looking forward to seeing her. Um, we all were hoping she would be able to, to join us today. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Joe, and he's going to kick us off with a, some pre a presentation, and then we're going to get to the, the most important part, the Q&A. So take it away, Joe. Great. Thanks, Sasha. That was a kind introduction, and um, I want to thank you and AASA uh, for inviting me to present. Um, and I hope to be a resource to everybody here. That's my goal for this call. I want to share some of our uh, reports on or and, and ideas around risk reduction strategies for schools based on a report that we wrote back in June and many schools are now uh, adopting and implementing. And I share uh, your disappointment, Sasha, too. Um, you know, I'm really looking forward to, I've been working with Emily and really looking forward to hearing her present. So another time uh, we'll get together. I'll, I'll uh, try to uh, fill that gap, but uh, no promises. So in addition to running the Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard, my background is really in exposure and risk science. I'm a certified industrial hygienist Industrial hygiene is the field that anticipates, recognizes, assesses, controls, and confirms that hazards are controlled in the workplace, be it uh, radiological, chemical, or biological like we're facing now. And I've been doing this uh, consulting for a long time. Outside of my role at Harvard, for 15 years, I've done forensic investigations of sick buildings, uh, you know, problems in schools, outbreaks in hospitals, uh, cancer clusters in offices. And I mention that because while the pandemic is unfamiliar to all of us, there's a lot of aspects that are really quite familiar. We know how to assess a hazard and we know how to put in controls to keep everyone safe. And in this context, it's kids and adults. 
So we know what to do and we've learned a lot uh, since this pandemic started on how to keep everybody safe. I'm a commissioner on the Lancet COVID-19 Commission where I chair their task force on safe work, safe schools and safe travel. So first, when we think about uh, schools, I wanna talk about the cost of school closures, which uh, many are aware of. We've been writing about this since uh, late spring about the costs that we're now seeing. And this includes things like virtual dropouts on the hundreds of thousands of kids who are just missing from the system. We've written about food insecurity, billions of missed meals due to closed schools, impacts on learning, we're seeing this in terms of uh, literacy, loss in literary, literacy gains, things that we predicted and we're actually seeing right now, we see more likelihood of failing grades. And this is happening everywhere in the country, Texas, Minnesota, DC, LA, Boston, New York, it's happening everywhere. We also know that kids who are not at school are higher risk for abuse, exploitation, neglect, and violence. So very often the conversation around schools and risk has been focused on COVID and in the classroom and hasn't really taken a wider lens on risk and the, and the devastating consequences of kids out of school. This is nothing short of a national emergency. And we know how to keep kids and adults safe in school. Now, we do get a break. A room full of 25 adults is different than a room full of 24 kids and one adult in that the risk profile for kids is different, very different. And the, this virus has not spared us in many ways, if any, except this one, that remarkably kids are less likely to get this than adults, particularly the younger kids. What's robust is that they are less likely to die if they get this virus. In fact, if you look at CDC's data on excess mortality, comparing this year to previous years, for those under 25 years old, there's a 2% decrease, 2% lower excess mortality this year compared to previous years. Also looks like kids are less likely to transmit. This looks robust for kids under 10. I'd say the evidence is more mixed for older kids. Also, these are joint probabilities, less likely to get it, less likely to transmit, and less likely to suffer the severe consequences. Now, focus on kids there. I wanna be, again, reiterate as I will many times that our focus is not just on protecting kids, it's also on protecting the adults in the school. And so we actually know how to do this. Um, we've seen this from uh, not just our understanding of uh, schools and risk, but also infection control in hospitals and offices uh, and everywhere else. We know what works and we know what doesn't because we've seen dramatic failures when controls are not put in place. So my team wrote a report in June, 60 page report on risk reduction strategies for reopening schools. At this point, many schools are open. So now it should be not just for reopening of your clothes, but how to stay open as case counts rise during this second wave we're experiencing. And we bucketed these into five different categories, healthy policies, healthy activities, healthy classrooms, healthy buildings, and healthy schedules. Now, really I wanna to get to the question and answer, answer portion of this. So I'm only gonna go through one of these and that is the healthy buildings because I think many schools, I hope, are already doing some of these basics like requiring masks in schools. But as we think about how this virus is transmitted, close contact, airborne transmission, so beyond six feet with in-room transmission, and very little from contaminated surfaces. And I'll talk about more about that. In fact, I had an op-ed in the Washington Post that came out this morning with other colleagues highlighting how we don't have any evidence, no confirmed evidence of fomite transmission, transmission through contaminated surfaces. And we are over-cleaning all of our buildings and spending resources in places we should not be spending them. We should be spending them on these healthy building strategies that are designed to limit the spread of airborne transmission. Specifically, you want to increase the amount of outdoor air coming into your school building. This could be as simple as opening up a window or if you have a mechanical system, bringing more outdoor air. Any recirculated air ideally runs through a higher grade filter called a MERV 13 filter, MERV. Third, if you can't do those or you wanna supplement that, you should do this or can do this with the use of portable air cleaners with HEPA filters. Now, in terms of how to assess ventilation, one of the guides my team put together uh, was a how-to. We spent the summer and weekends in the summer at schools around Massachusetts measuring ventilation rates, and then we turned it into a guide for schools everywhere so they can use this. It's a five-step guide, 
And I should, maybe I'll pause for a second and say, and we can put it in the chat, that all of these resources are available on my Harvard Healthy Buildings Program website at forhealth.org. And we set up a special page for schools, schools.forhealth.org. If you just Google Harvard Healthy Buildings Program, you'll see forhealth.org and you can navigate to schools. All these resources are there. So if you think about one, how do you measure ventilation rates? How much outdoor air is coming in? You can use something called an airflow capture hood or a bolometer that simply measures the flow of air. And in this case, there's 444 cubic feet per minute of outdoor air coming in. And then we can quantify how many air changes that is. And I'll explain what that is in a second. We can also quantify ventilation rates using tracer gas. And here we use carbon dioxide. So the picture on the left is, a, is dry ice that we sublimated, that we, we increased the CO2 concentrations indoors. And then on the right, to, de to determine how much fresh outdoor air was coming in, we opened up the windows just a couple inches. You'll notice one window is even closed. We just did as found conditions, that window was broken. And then doing this, we can, we can see how quickly the CO2 leaves the room. And that is a tried and true measure or technique for estimating ventilation rates. And I'll show you what this looks like. So here's a graph looking at CO2 concentrations. Across the horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is CO2 concentration in parts per million. So this is after we loaded up the room in CO, uh, with CO2. In this case, it was empty, unoccupied rooms. And then we watched the, how quickly the CO2 decays under different scenarios. So at first we said, well, let's use the unit ventilator, mechanical ventilation only. And you see we get about 1.6 air changes per hour. And then when we open up the window, we get a total of four air changes per hour. And then we open up the window and added a door opening. So it was a cross breeze or less resistance to that airflow. We got over five air changes per hour. And for reference, an air change per hour, it's how much fresh air from outdoors comes in the space. A typical home gets half an air change per hour. School, typical school, if it meets the code, should be getting three air changes per hour, roughly. We find most schools, when measurements are made across the country, rarely are hitting even that minimum. Now, importantly, we need targets. So what are we trying to achieve in terms of air changes per hour? So on the left is that triangle, the three approaches we recommend in that order, increase the ventilation rate, increase the filter efficiency on recirculated air to MERV 13, and number three, supplement with portable air cleaners with a HEPA filter. You're trying to achieve a total clean air, air change rate between four and six air changes per hour. So that ACH is air changes per hour. And again, if you're meeting code, it's three air changes per hour. And we want four to six air changes per hour. Now, you can get that through any combination of those three factors. So if you look at that little formula on the bottom, it's actually quite simple. And we lay this out in the report. It's how much air is moving in or being cleaned. So that's the clean air delivery, either from outside or through a portable air cleaner. In this sense, I'm talking about clean air being virus free, not necessarily clean of outdoor pollutants, but in the context of COVID-19, clean air, clean is virus free. So how much clean air from outdoors, how much is going through recirculated filters, and how much is being gone, goes through a filter with a portable filter uh, with a HEPA, HEPA filter, a portable unit with HEPA. It's a really straightforward and easy calculation. And I'll tell you this, we, we even built a tool with uh, Shelly Boulder, Shelly Miller at CU Boulder that's available on our website that walks through this calculation for you. So you can just put in the dimensions of your room, the length, the width, ceiling height, and it tells you how many air changes per hour of clean air you're getting and also what you should look for if you're going to use a portable air cleaner. So we tried to simplify the calculation for you. And then if you're interested in the more technical, we also have a white paper on our website that explains the science behind the clean air delivery rate and use of portable air cleaners. Okay, I want to talk about a, a new piece we wrote just um, two or three weeks ago in the Washington Post talking about distance in the context of risk controls and consequences. Specifically, we think the three foot distancing should be the norm in schools for kid to kid interactions, maintaining six foot interactions between adults and adult to kid. And here's why. 
So the six foot has forced schools to limit this in-person schooling largely due to space constraints, right? And, and it's become this, this factor, this key factor in limiting the number of kids that are getting back in schools. And the, we lay out this six fold argument as to why. One, I've already mentioned that the consequences and costs of school closures are severe and they are escalating rapidly. We are starting to see these reports every week now. We will see them for the coming months and we will see them for the coming years. It is um, really hard to fathom that some kids will be out of school for an entire year or more. It's hard to fathom the consequences. Number two, the strict foot, six foot distancing that's keeping kids out of school has forced many schools into a hybrid model. Well, the hybrid model, I agree with my colleague, uh, Bill Hanaj, an infectious disease epidemiologist at Harvard, who wrote about the hybrid model actually increasing risk for everybody. That's because there's an assumption, a faulty one, that when kids are not at school, they're somehow just at home and protected. But we know when kids are not in school, their social networks are actually wider. And so this actually increases the risk for everybody. Uh, number three, the six foot distancing has a, there is really no bright line cutoff. Uh, this is not grounded in any hard science. It was picked. I think it's a good idea to have a target. But there's no um, you know, medical or, or epidemiological evidence that six foot is a critical bright line cutoff. And, that's be, and you look at number four, there's been meta-analyses or, or uh, analyses of many studies showing that uh, when baseline risk is low, there's no additional benefit at three feet versus six feet. Number five, I think, is the most important. Because very often we talk about these controls in the absence of context of other controls. So we say, well, some will say, well, six foot distancing, if we don't have that, it's a problem. And if we think about where the six foot distancing or when the six foot distancing rule came into effect, it was roughly in February or March before universal masking. When you have these other controls in place that we recommend in our report, universal masking, better ventilation and filtration, distancing becomes less important. So if we're gonna talk about distancing, we have to talk about it in the context of other controls. If you look at what's happening, say for example, in hospitals, high risk environment, they've largely controlled risk through mass, uh, stringent masking protocols, good hand washing, and hospitals take care of their ventilation and filtration. They cannot physically distance. So it's not one of the strategies that's used. And six is the point I've made before that a room with uh, kids is different than a room full of adults. So our strategies and, and risk reduction approaches should reflect that. And so our holistic approach here, this layered defense approach, if we layer enough of these control strategies on top of each other, we can control risks to both kids and adults uh, in the classroom against the backdrop of what are staggering and devastating costs to having kids out of school. Last thing I'll do, and then I really wanna to get to your questions, uh, is just point you to the resources. So at the bottom there, that's the website, schools.forhealth.org. We have this report that's available as a PDF. You can read it on the website too. Uh, we've translated it into Spanish. We have uh, this ventilation guide. We have tips for selecting portable air cleaners. Uh, and all of the op-eds, six or seven op-eds I've written with other colleagues uh, at Harvard going back to July or, all, or June are all on this website, including the new op-ed on three-foot distancing, one that just came out this morning in Washington Post on we're overcleaning our, our surfaces. So you can read about our guidance there. And I'm happy to answer questions on that too. But all these resources at schools.forhealth.org. Uh, and I'll stop there and I'm happy to um, answer any questions that come my way. Great, that was super interesting. Um, so we, we are definitely getting some questions. Um, one of the first ones I think is just a level setting one, which is when you talk about kids, are you grouping all children and for these recommendations together, ages five through 18, or does some of the stuff, specifically the, the six versus three foot rule in particular, change based on the age of the group that you're referring to? So for me and our guidance, uh, it's for all kids, 18 and under, all the way through high school. I know there are others that are only want to, um, you know, narrow this down to the youngest kids. Clearly, the impacts are more devastating on the younger kids. The learning is not the same. And we know a lot more about um, they're less likely to transmit. That's more firm. The reality is we can keep kids and adults and kids in this context up to 18 or older even. We know how to keep people safe in any environment. 
It's a matter of having the appropriate control strategy in place. We can keep people safe in hospitals, high risk environments, if we choose to. Uh, and so the same can be said for schools. Uh, and I, you know, even at high levels of community spread, uh, we, can, we know how to keep everyone safe in the building if these controls are in place. Great. Um, and what about density? Because we got some questions about, the, especially just generally like states, it seems like they might be a little bit far behind where the science is or where your thinking is in terms of some of the recommendations that they're making that school districts have to, uh, to uh, follow. Um, in particular, you know, again, not having different rules for different age, ages of kids in the school, as well as um, you know, just having rules like you have, you can't have more than 50% density in a, in a school building. Um, where does that, how does that playing out right now in your mind? Well, I think it's a mistake. Um, and it's for the reason I mentioned earlier that this forces this hybrid model, which is a, creates a false sense of security that it's somehow uh, leading to lower community transmission or that kids are not interacting. I think it's forcing kids into other even higher risk activities where maybe controls are not in place. Um, and we've seen that even across Europe, uh, sc when schools have remained open, even in the context of, of higher spread, uh, that schools are not the source of community transmission, right? And so, um, you know, the density question is interesting, but if it's being used to keep kids out of school and creating a hybrid model, that's a problem. Uh, and also, if it's a higher density space, if you can keep even that three foot distancing between students and three to six between adults and six to six feet between adults, as long as you have these other controls in place, masking, better ventilation and filtration, uh, you know, there's no, first, I'll be clear, there's no such thing as zero risk in anything we do. So can there be cases and spread in a school? Absolutely, this virus can be spread anywhere, we've seen it. Can we significantly reduce the risk through these strategies? Absolutely, even at occupancies where every kid would not have to be sitting exactly six feet from each other. Understood, understood. As long as the ventilation scales accordingly, yeah. Right, right. And um, what someone asked about ionization systems and your thoughts on that quickly? Yeah, I would, um, I don't recommend it. I, I was really clear in my recommendations. If you noticed, I didn't mention any new technologies, nothing expensive, nothing that's gonna take months and months to implement. Um, it's time for the basic strategies that we know work. Better ventilation, better re filters on recirculated air, and supplement with portable air cleaners. Okay. And what about times like snacks time, lunch time, when masks aren't being more worn? Uh, do you have any best practices or advice for districts and how to do that? Yeah, I think this is really important. This would be a time when I would maximize distancing if masks come down, including increasing distancing for the teacher. I know in some school districts, even in cold weather, the teacher opens the window and, and spends more time near it. Um, and this, you know, if that means kids have to wear hats uh, and coats or whatever it is, I, I think that's a good idea. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So the rules change. And um, I've been saying, you know, we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. If that means the room's a little colder, then, then so be it, because the cost of kids out of school is just, is that, uh, is that severe. Um, another strategy I think is important, um, this starts to get harder to enforce, but is a good one. Uh, you know, mass down while actively eating and drinking. Some people are using it, adults too, in restaurants. Well, it's a mask break. I'll just keep the mask up for the full hour, even though I'm only eating for maybe, what, 10 minutes, five minutes? It's not that long. So masks should be up when you're not actively eating. The other one that um, I've been laughed out of the room sometimes and teachers, when I, but I think it's a good strategy if you can try to enforce it. If you're eating in the classroom, you could try to have it be quiet time. It's different from how cafeterias normally are. I get that. But if you're having uh, lunch in the classroom, and the masks come down, if that's a quieter time, you have a lower emission rate. That's obviously harder to enforce, especially with the younger kids. But if you want a whole set of strategies, yeah, I think that's one we should try and do. Those are, those are great recommendations. Um, I'm just, we're getting so many questions. I apologize. Uh, I'm trying to group them together a little bit. Uh, so uh, one question I had was, uh, that came up was about studies showing uh, that kids not, don't just transmit less, but are just tested less. And is, is it, I mean, do you feel fairly confident in the fact that there's, there's both evidence that, um, I mean, obviously they're getting tested less, but they're, what about studies showing that that, that, that it relates to why their, their, their infection rate is so low? Yeah, I think it's a good hypothesis, but it's been debunked. Um, and so I, I'm on this, uh, I chair the task force for the Lancet Commission, as I mentioned, on safe work and safe schools. And we have experts um, who study this, including myself. Uh, and one was just posting a review today that shows even if you, so if you look at all the studies, including the ones that account for issues around testing, the different type of tests, seroprevalence studies, which are not biased by testing in any way, they're all saying the same thing. 
So that uh, fact is not an artifact of some kind of issue around who gets tested, who doesn't, asymptomatic or symptomatic. It's actually uh, robust that the younger kids in particular uh, look like they transmit less. Great. Um, and then what about uh, issues with the humidification between 40 to 60 percent to control the virus? Yeah, so I wrote an op-ed about this with some colleagues a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a good strategy, and, and but, I'll, but I'll tell you, it's really difficult in schools, and it's, there's a reason I didn't mention it in my core strategy set, because it's hard to do in schools. It is hard to humidify and get to 40 to 60 percent relative humidity. How does it work? Well, your, your lung, your, your defense, your lung defenses work better at 40 to 60 percent relative humidity, more mucus, better ciliated action that lets you bring up anything you, you breathe in and swallow harmlessly. Also, the virus decays faster at 40 to 60% relative humidity. That said, the mechanism of action for removal is quicker through ventilation and filtration. So if you had to say, well, you know, I'm gonna keep my school closed because my humidity is too low. So let's say in the Northeast when it gets into winter and the hum relative humidity is low. Let's say if you have ventil good ventilation and filtration, humidity is the next factor. I would say it's a nice to have, not a must have in this context. Yeah, and that, that speaks to the fact that some folks are saying, well, what about offices and classrooms that don't have windows? You know, what should we do in that situation? So very similar, you know, first, if you're, in, unless you're in a closet, um, there should be some kind of ventilation, right? So you can look at your diffuser and see how much outdoor air is coming in. If you truly are in a place that has no air coming in, there needs to be some airflow in there. Now, let's say you have a central room, no windows, maybe the airflow is not as good as it should be because maybe it's an older system in a building. That's the perfect place to have a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter. If you put one in that room, and because there's not a lot of air exchange rate, the, the portable unit with the HEPA is gonna be even more effective. And those, if they size them right, you can get four, five, six, or more air changes per hour through that HEPA filter. So it can, it's a nice way, I mean, we always want ventilation, but in the context of COVID-19 and, and disease transmission, uh, the filtration is a nice way to fill a gap if you can't do ventilation. And, and we didn't talk too much about busing, but I'm getting a bunch of questions now about that. So again, the density regulations in some states, it's making it very challenging to not do hybrid when you have that, when you have that in place. So what do we know about the best practices for busing? Yeah, I think there's been a misunderstanding about exposure and risk that translates to um, uh, buses and, and even cars. Um, and, um, and really exposure is a function of three things, intensity of exposure, frequency and duration. Um, and if you look at how to control the intensity on the bus, the concentration, uh, colleagues of mine did measurements of air exchange rates on a bus. Windows down just an inch or two, you will get 30 to 40 air changes per hour when that bus is moving. Now remember, in a typical home in the US, half an air change. Minimum for schools is three. We want four to six. On a bus, you're getting 40. A hospital airborne infection isolation room gets 12 air changes. Point being, if you have kids on a bus with masks, keep a little extra distance from the driver. I wouldn't de-densify fully. Windows open just a little bit will keep, uh, is a good way um, to reduce that risk. And I do wanna say one thing off the bus because I, my personal philosophy, um, you know, I'm, I'm conservative by nature in terms of my uh, risk tolerance. I follow the precautionary principle. I, I take my role as a public health professor very seriously. I have three kids of my own. Uh, and my gut check on all of this is always, you know, would my answer be different if my kid was on that bus or in that school or my wife was a teacher there? And so I'm not coming at this with any kind of cavalier attitude. It's really coming at it from a grounded in the science on exposure, risk, evidence-based strategies uh, of controlling this uh, in schools. Appreciate it. Um, so we have some specific questions about uh, UV and HVAC and in classrooms. Some schools are recommending that practice. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I'd put it on that list where, you know, I went one, two, three, ventilation, filtrate, recirculated filtration, supplemental four, maybe advanced air cleaning technologies. UV can work. It's ex more expensive, uh, higher maintenance costs. You have to be careful because you have a radiation hazard. It can be done. It can be put in the ducts. And really the only way I'd go to UV in this scenario is if I had recirculated air pushing through a filter and my system couldn't do it because it's harder to push air through a better filter. So you get a, we call it higher pressure drop. And so if you need a way to clean that air, but you can't have the pressure drop, well, UV is just a light. So there's no pressure drop and you can still disinfect or clean that air. 
Um, I, it's just more expensive. It, it's definitely harder to implement and you have to be a lot more careful in terms of the maintenance um, when, you, when you use that. So UV can certainly work upper, uh, you know, um, uh, in duct or even upper room, but I don't go there first in terms of uh, schools. There are simpler strategies that are effective. Great. Um, here's an interesting question I have too as well. Um, to uh, some schools are, of course, you have used in the past pin pads, finger scanners, that sort of thing. You know, for a variety of things, whether it's you know lunch rooms, etc. Um, all students touch them uh, because you said <laughs> that uh, you know that we're over cleaning our schools um, and surfaces. Does that mean that we can return to using those kinds of things now? Yeah, so fomite transmission, fomite is just the word we use for any inanimate object that can act as a source of transference, right? So it's touch pads, a pencil could be a fomite, a doorknob, a railing. And if you look at all the data on fomite transmission, we actually don't have any confirmed cases through fomite transmission. Now, can it happen? Absolutely, it can happen. Is it driving this pandemic? No way. You could think about like, for example, the choir outbreak. It's hard to see how you'd get like a 90% attack rate 90% of the people got sick from one person through touching a surface, right? As soon as the second person touched a contaminated surface, you're going to remove a lot of the virus. But it's easy to see how through shared air, you could get an attack rate that high. So if fomite transmission is happening, it's not happening that much and it's not driving this pandemic. I'll also say this, it's easy to control through hand washing or use of hand sanitizer. So absolutely, we have to continue hand washing, hand sanitizer. That's a better way to break the chain of transmission. Because think about the logic of the, of the surface cleaning we do, right? We clean all the surfaces, but it's impossible to clean it after every person has touched it. It's not practical, it's not possible. So already we're kind of, you know, accepting that that's happening. And the better way to do it is to, in our report, we talk about building a culture of health, safety, and shared responsibility. Hand, of course, stay home when you're sick. Hand wash when you come into the school. As soon as, you, every time you enter a classroom, every time you exit a classroom. So if you're building this into the culture, it's the better way and more effective way of breaking the transmission chain from any surfaces. So as the mom of a kindergartner, I, I'm interested in what your thoughts are then on you know, shared books and project-based learning and, and those kinds of activities. I think that, that folks are dying to do with kids, just allow them to share the materials a little bit more fluidly and, and freely in classrooms, particularly the younger students. Is that something that you know, re really we should consider going back to? I, I absolutely think we should be thinking about this and allowing more of it to happen because one, it's not practical to you know, clean a pencil every time it's passed or clean a book. Um, it doesn't mean we have to be, uh, you know, throw caution to the wind here. But I, again, I think if we have periodically hand washing and hand sanitizer in a classroom, that's gonna be much more effective um, than any other approach trying to sanitize between usage. And, and if that's limiting kids' ability to actually learn and do things, then yeah, they should be encouraged because we just don't see a lot of evidence or any really that fomite transmission is really happening. That's, that's really great. That's really good news. Um, does uh, someone ask, um, does the recess fields and carpool areas that are outdoor mean that there's relatively no transmission happening there when kids are getting in and out of, you know, out of the school building and, and in the cars, et cetera? Yeah, you mean, is that essentially a question about the time outdoors? Yeah, I, I think it's, I think, I think that's what they're getting at. I think they're worried just generally about, you know, crowding, you know, and, and say pickup lines and things like that, where kids are getting in and out of, out of cars and, and, you know, yeah. there's, there's, it's not hard to, it's hard to do distancing. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons too, why we see, you know, if schools are not um, leading to all this transmission, and we know that distancing has been hard, look at what happens before schools, after schools, outside of schools, kids are not distancing, we still don't see this them being as uh, schools being the source of major spread. Um, you still want to encourage distancing. I think that's good. More is better. I just don't, we just don't think the three foot distancing should be keeping kids out of school. But we want to encourage this and outdoors. Yeah, we get the benefit where the ventilation question is taken out from us because you essentially have unlimited dilution. Now you still have to worry about close contact transmission. So when you're outside, still absolutely masks should be on. I mean, I want to be really clear. The single most effective strategy for reducing risk in schools or anywhere is universal masking. Um, and this simply this, right? Even if you have masks that are imperfect in terms of efficiency, take a 70% efficient mask, but particles have to go through two masks. So if I cough out hundred particles, 30 escape into space. Then they hit your mask where 21 get captured, another 70%, nine get through. Universal masking has just reduced risk by over 90%. 
Now, the ventilation and filtration is what's going to take care of the space between masks. And outdoors, we have a lot of that. So you can quickly see how this masking can reduce uh, the spread if we use good masks, take mm -hmm. care of ventilation filtration, outdoors still wear masks, uh, it can really drive down um, risk. And uh, outdoors is clearly, clearly uh, lower risk than indoors everywhere. Right, right. That's, that's a great example. That was really helpful. Thank you. Um, can you point to some specific schools which are at full occupancy and staying open using your layered advice? Sure, I mean, I don't wanna name um, schools I've helped or work with, but there are many schools who you know, got our uh, report in June, made a checklist, got it all done. Um, so this is happening and we see, well, we see examples also of schools being reopened uh, throughout Europe and different parts of the country with different layers of controls in place. So we absolutely think it should not just be um, schools, everybody back jam packed in, no changes. I mean. Schools have to take this seriously in terms of, the, of these controls across all of the dimensions that we mentioned. So um, it's about behavior change. It's responsibility. Importantly, the culture of health, safety, and shared responsibility is so key because you can only control, you being people who run buildings, school buildings, what's happening in your school. But that's a couple hours a day. It's not after school. It's not evenings. It's not weekends. And so it's really about building the culture of health in the community too, that everyone has a shared responsibility. We wanna keep kids in schools, we wanna keep schools open, we wanna keep everyone safe. It's about all our individual actions, not just the, what can the school building do for the six hours you're in there, but what is everybody else doing to limit the potential for introduction of cases into school in the first place. Right, right. Now, putting on your advocacy hat for a second, you know, there, there I'm seeing a lot of questions about, you know, our state guidance is way behind. Uh, they're not doing these things. You know, how long is it going to take for us to get new evidence-based guidance to the state uh, or local level? And you know, how can we how can we push this along a little faster? Well, there's no question that we've had a total failure of leadership in this country since January. We have not taken it seriously. It's been called a hoax. Um, we've had misinformation coming from the highest levels of the government. It's led to widespread confusion. Uh, and unfortunately, this has permeated and percolated down to different states. So I'm hopeful that we have, uh, you know, we have a new incoming CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who's absolutely fantastic. And the, 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 the amount of consistent information coming out of the federal government will change. It will change instantly on day one out of our CDC. We have the world's premier disease fighting agency that has been utterly sidelined through the worst public health crisis we've faced in our lifetimes. It's incomprehensible to me. Um, and we're starting to see some of this shift already in that there's been a loosening or demuzzling of, of scientists in the CDC. So we see better guidance out there. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think anything's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. We haven't seen it happen for the first 10 months, but I'm hopeful that as the new administration comes in, uh, we'll see more consistent guidance. Not hopeful. I know it will happen. More consistent guidance on, you know, there's no reason my program at the School of Public Health at Harvard should have had to create a report on risk reduction strategies for schools. This should have been done by the federal government early on, right? As soon as schools were closed in March, it just, schools have not been the priority they needed to be. So, uh, this is, it's been confusing for everybody. I feel, uh, I feel for parents, I feel for teachers, administrators, superintendents. It's been hard to navigate this. And a lot of that's because of a lot of the disinformation out there. It's been a confusing landscape unnecessarily. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and in addition to that, there's of course, you know, politics at the local level that play into opening and closing decisions as well. Um, and, and so um, one person asked, do you have advice uh, on helping teachers unions or teachers or, you know, just reluctant school, uh, school folks um, uh, understand and feel comfortable with your recommendations? Like where, how can we, how can we move in this direction? Because uh, we're not always just bound by uh, what the evidence is telling us in, in reopening decisions, unfortunately. Yeah, certainly I've seen that and everyone on this call knows better than I do. Um, the local politics have been, um, uh, in many, in my experience, uh, just quite shocking to be to be blunt, um, and uh, I, I'm not sure how to navigate it. I, I think the science is clear. I feel like when we've presented to teachers, parents, administrators, and there's a, this kind of forum taking place, and we say this is what the science is, I think it has given many uh, comfort. I don't mean false comfort, but it says, well, here, let, let's understand the science and hear it. Uh, I know that has not been enough to move the needle in many places. 
Um, but you know, we have we have to make these decisions as a society, and we're we're making one in many places that we're okay with kids being out of school for what could be an entire year. And I don't think we've quite um, grasped just how uh, bad that is and is going to be in the coming years. These reports are trickling in, and they're bad. Uh, and we will see this. We know what happens when kids are out of school. And, and there's there 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 are missing stories. These are just the stories we're hearing. But if you have all these kids missing. Uh, there's a lot that's not um, coming out. And I'm not, you know, teachers are doing an amazing job trying to keep this going. Same with parents who are working, but it's a, it's a broken scenario. We have hybrid models, kids at home. When we know, we know schools are not driving transmission. And we also know what strategies, if they're put in place, can reduce risk for everyone in the building, including adults. Very true, very true. Um, this is uh, um, a question that around, um, community transmission. Um, how does community transmission rates impact uh, whether or not students should be going to school if the rates are really high? You know, so we haven't seen this as community spread has increased in many places in Europe uh, that schools are influencing this really. Um, so, you know, it's my opinion, and I think early on many of us were watching and weighing in on at what level of community spread should different controls be happening. It's my opinion that um, we should have schools open regardless of the level of community spread. Now, that doesn't, like I said before, that doesn't mean we just open the doors and jam everyone in there and say it's like schools were uh, last year. Right? You have to put in these. I would never advocate for any school opening in areas with high community spread without these controls in place. Absolutely, masks need to be worn. Absolutely, you have to take care of these or do these healthy building um, strategies. But I just don't think we should have, for example, you know, uh, K through five kids out of school right now. I think the costs are just too severe. Very true. Um, and I, this is a question I received. It's a little uh, slightly off topic, but um, if you have good air ventilation and filtration in your home, should family members wear masks at home if some members work outside of the home or go to school daily? So I don't think that's practical uh, or really possible for most people, right? Um, I would say some of these basic strategies, my windows open a little bit, right? I, 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 we don't have people over who aren't in our immediate um, family. Uh, if we do, we meet outside. I think that's what we should be doing, but right, many people, uh, if they're out working, they have to be out at work. I just think we take these basic controls, you should have the portable air cleaner strategy. If you wanna have a portable humidifier to increase humidity for respiratory health, I think that's a good idea. Open up some windows as best you can, recognizing in some parts of the country, it's about to get real cold. Um, so you take these basic precautions, and then if someone is uh, is sick in your family or has has uh, COVID nineteen, then there are additional strategies you want to take, and we've written about these, and I can they're on our website too. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, speaking of cold, do you have any comments about ventilation in in really Arctic or cold weather environments, and when the stress is there for for districts? Yeah, so I this is what I mean about the you know ventilation and filtration working together. The clean air delivery rate or air change per hour are additive through any combination. So as you lose the ability to ventilate because it's maybe um, uh, colder air and you can't condition as much, well then the filtration becomes that much more important. Mm -hmm. So even if you're recirculating air, right, and you want fresh outdoor air for other reasons, but in terms of this virus, if you're recirculating air in a room, as long as it's going through a good filter, this MERV 13 or higher. You're delivering clean air. So, you know, as ventilation becomes harder, filtration becomes more important. Right. And someone said, like, can we just put a fan next to a teacher in the back if we have good, you know, filtration systems just to keep the air flowing? And what do you no, So, I'd be careful with just a simple box fan, box fan in the window to help bring in air. Let's say in parts of the country that we're temperate right now, great idea. As long as it's not blowing, you know, past, let's say, me to a, somebody next to me. So you don't want to be moving air right across the breathing zone onto somebody else. Um, but, you know, a strategy portable air cleaner, I mean, I keep going back to this. We've written extensively about it, uh, putting it near the teacher, the middle of the room. This can really, this can really help. Yeah. And what about um, special education students? We know that they've been the first in some cases to come back in, in districts. And some of those students, especially those who are medically fragile or, or who just have a mask exemption for other reasons, um, what kind of advice do you have about keeping them and, and, and school staff safe? Yeah, re really great question. And, and we were talking about this with the school district last night. Um, and so the three foot guidance I, would not apply. I would say, look, if someone's not in a mask, you have to keep extra distance. This is where the de-densification becomes even more important. So how can you have fewer students and teachers per volume of space or per square footage of space? Um, this is where the extra controls. So think about 
you know, th that idea we have the dual mass and the, and the ventilation filtration controlling space between the mass. Well, you lose the mask on one side, you wanna have even higher ventilation and filtration targets. So in that kind of space, extra distancing, even more air or better filtration and fewer people in that space. Yep. And uh, this is a question I think we received a couple of times. I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, wondering whether, you know, 25 high school seniors are more similar to 25 adults than they are to kids. So what would be the recommendation for adult groups of 25 in a room for an hour? Well, I mean, these are the, the, the basics of what we've been talking about. First, I, I wouldn't, I don't think we should be having groups of uh, 25 adults, uh, unless it's something that's critical, like, you know, you're out of the grocery store, the pharmacy might have that number of people, but it's proportional to the amount of space. Uh, here, adults should stay more than six feet or more apart. Everyone should be wearing a mask. The same, the strange strategies apply. The difference is with adults too, is that the risk profiles change. While the, the risk of death from this virus to young kids is extraordinarily low. It's extraordinarily high as you get older. In fact, if you hit in the 70s or 80s, it's remarkable how high risk this is. So um, we have to be cautious there, take extra precautions, recognizing the mix of people is different. Also, we have higher exhalation rates or emission rates for adults. It depends on the activity, right? I think a high risk place would be a gym, like a workout gym, you're in there and uh, you know, small volume place and many adults in there breathing harder. If someone's not wearing a mask, I think these are some of the highest risk locations we have, like a restaurant when masks are down. Okay, and these are two tough questions um, about how can what should a district that doesn't have more of thirteen filters do, or a school that it just currently doesn't have an operational HVAC system? How can they improve ventilation and filtration? So, if you don't have an operational HVAC, I mean, we've underinvested in our school buildings for decades, and we're paying the price right now. I think many school districts are seeing this. Not, it's not their fault. We've underinvested in schools buildings as a country. Uh, for decades, really. So if you have a non-functional mechanical system, I'd say get that fixed. I, I, it's, it's not acceptable to have a non-functioning mechanical system. If it's a poorly one, I think you could do a process called commissioning. I think it's a great idea for every school district. If you commission your system, commissioning is the process by which it'd be like a, a car getting a tune-up. You're making sure your system's working the right way. One, it'll save you money better indoor air quality, and you'll find out what your system can and can't do. So commissioning is a great step. I think every school, every building should be doing this regularly, to be honest. Um, so you have to think about the, um, the mechanical system is doing something, and it's just what can it handle? Can it handle better filters or not? And the reason we keep going back to the portable air cleaner, it's a total stopgap solution. I'm not in favor of using portable air cleaners you know, for the next 10 years in schools, but if you're saying, can we get through December through June, when these vaccines really start having their taking their uh, having their uh, effect and benefit to society, can we get through these next six months of schools, even with a bad air handling system? Uh, yeah, we can do that through these portable devices. There's a cost to it, but it's nothing. It's absolute pennies compared to the cost of kids being out of school. Understood. Yeah. So, um, what impact do plexiglass shields around desks have? I know lots of districts invested in those early on. Are they actually helping to, to limit air recirculation in some instances? Yeah, so we don't recommend plexiglass. Um, you know, plexiglass is going to stop ballistic droplets. So, you know, um, uh, if you you know, if someone coughs or sneezes, but masks also capture a lot of these ballistic droplets, right? Problem with plexiglass is that sometimes you, you change the, well, not sometimes, you change the airflow in the space. So if a plexiglass barrier is blocking air from a duct from coming in and, and diluting, you can have pockets of higher concentrations. So one way to think about it is that the room is not as well mixed, right? The air isn't flowing. You don't have air coming in from outdoors or being filtered. It can get stuck in these pockets. I think the use of plexiglass is good in, in fixed locations where there's a lot of people coming through, for example, at grocery checkouts, I think that's a great idea. Maybe at um, you know a desk or a cashier at the cafeteria, I think that's an okay idea. But you know, putting them everywhere in the school classroom, I'd be more concerned about how that's influencing and diluting or preventing the dilution uh, in a micro environment space. Uh, and um, in terms of, oh, here's a quick easy one. Do you have a, a, a specific portable air filter product or unit that you recommend in terms of, I, mean, I don't know if anyone's uh, have been uh, emailing you about their products and you feel comfortable referring them to any of them, but. Yeah, I don't, I'm device agnostic um, for obvious reasons. So I don't recommend a certain brand, but we have this in the report. All you need to look for is the brand's CADR, clean air delivery rate. 
And a good rule of thumb is you want about 350 CADR for every 500 to 750 square feet. So I'll say it again, look for about 350 CADR to be on the package or in the specifications of the device for every 500, 750 square feet. If you go to our website, we have that Excel-based calculator or Google Sheets mm -hmm. that will let you type in the size of your room. You put in the clean air delivery rate, it'll tell you how many air changes per hour that you would get from that room. So you could say, for example, you have the interior room, certain size, eight foot ceilings. If I bought a device that was 200 CADR, how many air changes would I get? And that way you can see if you're gonna hit that four to six air change per hour target we recommend. Understood, okay. Um, we're getting close to time. So I'm trying to uh, winnow down the remaining questions. So this is your last chance to re-up one if I missed one, I apologize if I did. I'm trying to do my best to get to everybody. Um, where are we? Um, oh, well, earlier, here's a, I guess, a clarifying question. Earlier in the session, um, you know, you discussed your concerns with hybrid learning, of course, um, but then you just said before that, um, you know, 25 kids in a classroom isn't, isn't what we would expect to have. So since most classrooms, you know, in some places have kids, uh, class sizes larger than 25 and and how can we how can we kind of is there a, is there a number that would be appropriate to have in a in a class i mean or is it all again depend on the size of the classroom and and that sort of thing yeah i'm not sure i said uh 25 maybe i was talking about the 25 adults but i i don't think um we should be limiting we should be using the space constraints the six foot distancing to limit the number of students in a classroom so if you have more students and you're and you're hitting these air change targets with mass as long as you have that ability to stay three feet away, and if you have more students in a space, it can't be an overcrowded classroom. So in our report, we document or say we, we give the default occupant density. So if you're going to exceed the default occupant densities from a, the, the standard setting body that sets ventilation rates, mm -hmm. roughly 25 students to 35 per thousand square feet, if you're going to exceed that, you have to enhance these controls. Okay. So let me be very clear. I'm not talking about we should jam, you know, get everybody in the classroom, fill the auditoriums again. We have to still be cautious, but we shouldn't just be limiting the number of kids coming to school. I've seen many schools, you know, map out six foot little boxes for every student. And that means half the class can be in there. And that doesn't right. make much sense to me at all. Right. Okay. That's, that's very helpful clarification. Um, here's a question about, um, uh, emergency drills. Uh, so lockdown drills, for example, um, can we do these? Should we try to modify them, um, which we'll be practicing as we would in a real emergency. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a hard question. Um, I'm not really sure what the answer is there, right? Because we want to, uh, I would say if everyone's masked up, you want to keep doing your drills, certainly keep doing the fire drills. Um, and if everyone's masked up, um, the risks, again, should be low. I would just have the adults stay further away, especially if it's in a drill um, and the students, you know, trying to keep three feet apart. I know that's going to vary based on the drill you're trying to do and your procedures and protocols, but clearly we should continue to do our safety drills, particularly uh, the fire drills. Got it. Um... And then in terms of updates to the any documents you released, we, we had a couple of specific questions on, on different pieces of it, so like asking about page numbers and things like that, but um, which I you probably don't know offhand. Uh, but um, you know, since there is such an emphasis around the focusing on the community spread, uh, it someone said it seems like you are indicating a need to move away from that. Um, and our the question was, are you planning on updating your formal document to remove metrics like that and, and to call out specifically the three-foot spacing recommendation? Yeah, so our report on risk reduction strategies, the revision in November uh, spe specifically included the changes around plexiglass and three foot distancing. Okay, The great. report they're probably referring to is one I wrote with other Harvard colleagues um, related to community spread metrics that we wrote in July. I will tell you that um, I've been, uh, we've been working on this for the past two months and we have a revision to that coming out. And while I can't tell you what's in that report, I will tell you my personal opinion is that yes, we should be moving away from community spread metrics as a basis to close schools. I think schools should be open. Right, understood. That's very helpful, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, any, any uh, again, I would think the folks just want you to reiterate that three feet is okay for any age group of kids. So eight K through 18, right? Three foot is, is, is okay. 
Yeah, that's my opinion. I think yeah. clearly um, the younger uh, groups, there's less transmission, but I also think there are these, you know, very often we, we've been having, everyone's having these conversation about the cost of being out of school and we focus on the young kids. There are costs to teens, young teens and, and older teens uh, being out of school too. And we can control those risks as well. I mean, a lot of this, if we think about the risk strategies that are in hospitals, this is a very high risk environment. Many people actively infectious and shedding virus and we control adult to adult risk or exposure through these stringent controls. Everyone needs a good mask. Ideally, we're beyond the, the time when a, you know, a bandana uh, suffices as a mask, a three layer mask that's fit well. There's all guidance out there. We release this guidance right over the bridge of the nose, tight around the nose, should cover around the whole chin with a three layer mask. It's not something we want, you know, uh, where the gaps out the side where air can escape. So we need a, a focus on, and, and, and I would like to see school districts specify what constitutes a good mask. There's enough out there. World Health Organization has put this out. CDC has put this out. We have studies showing what constitutes a, a, a layering of masks and what materials are effective versus anything you can buy anywhere or make on your own. Um, so it's time for, for better masks. Absolutely. Um, and I want to end uh, with uh, just a comment from one of one of the folks listening who said, we, we can't thank you enough, Dr. Allen, for all that you've done and continue to do. Our school wouldn't have opened in August for in-person learning five days a week without the work of you and your team. And I know that's a sentiment expressed by many other people. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you so much for, for answering all of these questions. Um, we're definitely going to make sure that you, everyone who, who RSVP or registered for this webinar gets a copy uh, of it that they can share again. It's on Facebook Live as well. Um, thank you so much for spending this time with me. We, we were sad not to have uh, Emily Oster with us today, but you did an incredible job sharing your, your knowledge and expertise on so many different issues. So thank you again for doing this. Yeah, thanks, Sasha. And thanks, everybody. I really appreciate having uh, the opportunity to talk. I hope it was helpful and uh, answered uh, your questions um satisfactorily and um you know we're all in this together I, I believe everyone's really has the best interests of kids in their mind and everyone's doing their best um and hopefully uh this gives you some guidance for how we think is a is a path to keeping your schools open or getting them reopened if they're not open thanks absolutely thanks everyone for joining us stay safe